see uh, you have a PowerPoint. But again, it, it went off. Okay, you guys can see it now, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Perfect. so I'll test, yeah, case, this is fine because, you know, I, I understand what the problem is. Sometimes, you know, with, uh, with Mac, uh, you know, PowerPoint doesn't work in that, um, you know, screen share mode or something like that. But this is fine. This is good. Yep. Perfect. Yeah, and we can see the full screen also for now. Okay, okay, awesome. Should I get should I get us started? Yes. Yep. Perfect. So I am so excited to be speaking to you all today. And today I'm going to be talking about building wearable technology, leveraging the principles of nature to connect humans and computers. And so this is a quote from Elon Musk. And this is a quote from Elon Musk from two years ago, actually. And it reads, mark my words, AI is far more dangerous than nukes. And this is from two years ago. What we're seeing is as humans, we're having a healthy fear and respect of artificial intelligence. And with artificial intelligence, we've all seen kind of some of the, the bad parts that can come from it. We've seen images that aren't really real, people talking and saying things they never actually said. And so humans are in order, so humans are getting nervous about artificial intelligence. And what we're seeing is in order to compete with artificial artificial intelligence, humans and computers are merging. And so really the challenge of the 21st century is to merge man with machine in a healthy way to ensure the future constitutes the will of humanity and nature. And right now we're seeing this merger happen in a few different ways. We're seeing it happen through our external computers, through our wearable computers and through our implantable computers. Now, our external computers, like our cell phones and our laptops, they have a pretty slow input and output method. We're bound by how fast we can type on a keyboard. Our interaction is limited to these clunky machines. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have implantable computers. And implanted, implantable computers have a really fast input and output method, so fast that because they're interfaced directly into your brain. So this means that sometimes these computers actually know what you're thinking before you necessarily have registered that you've thought it. But these implantable computers are pretty far away from mass adoption. And I don't know about you all, but right now I do not want to be getting a computer implanted into my brain. And so what we're left with in the middle is the most perfect wearable computer in my eyes, because it's close to your body, which means it has a fast input and output method because it directly reads the signals from your body. It's convenient. We're not plugged into walls and whatnot, and it's here today. But the wearable computers of today are entering a Goldilocks zone where we want wearable technology that feels really close to our body, but doesn't feel too close to our body. We want it to know all of the data we want it to know, but if it knows a little bit too more and feels a little too invasive, we get uncomfortable with it. And we want wearable computers that look really cool and really flashy and awesome, but then at the same time, we want these same computers to be incredibly inspicuous. And so it's a really exciting field to be working in today. But today, all of our wearable computers imitate science fiction because engineers and designers have looked to science fiction to create the next generation of wearable computers. And this was found in a study in the MIT Technology Review in 2018. It's not just, it's not just a coincidence that all of our wearable technology looks like sci-fi. And this is really odd when you think about it because the whole premise behind science fiction is leaving this planet behind and moving on to the next planet. It's leaving this earth behind and moving on to these utopian, highly efficient or highly efficient places of living and this idea of all about efficiency. And when you think about it, that's pretty odd because as humans, we evolved on this earth for millions and millions of years. But science fiction has only been around for the last hundred years. And so ultimately, if we want wearable technology that feels natural, we have to have wearable technology that imitates nature because we have so much to learn from nature. And so to successfully blend man and machine, we have to build wearable computers that emulate the models, the systems, and the elements of nature. And these are what I call biomimetic wearable computers that merge the body and computer through the imitation of nature in both form and function. 
And so I'll start off today by showing you a few different wearable computers. The first is this cybernetically enhanced spine. And so with this spine, the materiality of the copper creates a galvanic skin sensor that responds to the salt and human sweat. So the entire spine itself becomes a sensor. And as humans, the more we sweat, the saltier we get, which actually means we get more and more conductive. And so as the user sweats more and more, the spine actually feeds off of the wearer, pulsing with light and highlighting our parasitic relationship between humans and computers. And so here we can see a video of the spine in action. And so that was Parasite, the first wearable computer I'm showing you today. And this next wearable computer is actually called the mating collar. And the mating collar emulates animals' natural mating practice to entice potential partners. And so in this case, mating collar is emulating the birds of paradise, which are the birds in the rainforest that put on a dance to try to find their mate. And so the mating collar uses a sonar sensor and a heart rate, a heart rate sensor. So it can tell when the wearers, when the wearer gets excited by someone approaching the sensor, the, the, excuse me, the collar actually begins to flutter to intense, entice potential partners. And so here you can see the mating collar in action. And again, this is looking directly at nature and copying nature to create wearable devices that feel natural. And so here it is. And so the next biomimetic wearable computer I'm going to show you all today is called Musical Prosthetics. And Musical Prosthetics are a new series of musical instruments that are attached to the body in various exoskeletal formations. And each of these prosthetics is wired with sensors that create sounds triggered by body movements. And so each one of the three musical prosthetics explores a primary aspect of human emotion. So there's a ha happy prosthetic, there's a mad prosthetic, and a sad prosthetic. And these prosthetics emulate how bugs actually rub their bodies together to make sounds. And so here we can see what a conversation would look like between someone who is angry, which is the spiky prosthetic, and someone who is worried, which is the leather prosthetic. And so that was just one video of the musical prosthetics. There's actually a series of nine videos showing different interactions between different prosthetics as well as the prosthetics and musicians. Um, 
And so the next biomimetic wearable computer is one of my favorites, I have to say, and it is called iSpy. And so iSpy uses the principles of biomimicry as a form of counter surveillance. And so the way that, so iSpy is based off of, I'm wondering how to explain this one. <laughs> So iSpy uses a style scan algorithm that's trained with thousands of images of moths in human eyes. And so a style scan algorithm is a machine learning algorithm which can create images. And so by training this algorithm with pictures of moths in human eyes, the algorithm actually began to develop its own hybrid species of moths that had human eyes on their back. And so in nature, moths can, so in nature, moths are, have fake eyes on, the, on their backs to scare away potential predators. And in this case, it's generated this new species of moths that have human eyes on, its, on their back. And these human eye moth combos actually trick, counter, actually trick surveillance into thinking that they're real life humans. And so a surveillance camera would actually pick up the moth eyes as opposed to the wearer's eyes or the human eyes. And so the whole point of iSpy is using screens not for the wearer's pleasure, but actually using screens to combat other screens and create a barrier between the digital and the physical world. And you can see it in action in this video. And so these, all of the wearables I've shown you today have all been biomimetic wearable computers. They've all been focused on looking at nature and how nature solves certain problems and then trying to copy that and then apply it to our problems. And that was really interesting. And that was at the center of my practice for many years was biomimicry. How can we look, copy and repeat? But ultimately we have to look beyond tomorrow and we have to look into the future because the future is beyond biomimicry. Because ultimately, if we want wearable technology that feels natural to our bodies, why not just make wearable technology that is natural? And ultimately, if we don't give nature a voice, it will be drowned out. We're, str we're struggling as a planet with climate change. And so why not actively take nature with us as a designer and as a collaborator in order to ensure nature has a space in our future? And so this next collection that I'm going to show you is the Beyond Biomimicry collection. And it's looking at how can we design with, with interspecies collaborations to ensure that nature has a space in our future. And it's creating designs that feel natural to our bodies because they are natural. These designs are all grown, not made. And so here you can see a sneak peek of the Beyond Biomimicry collection. And then I'll, take, I'll show you the whole collection in full detail.
And so now I'm going to take you guys through the entire process of the Beyond Biomimicry collection. And so I think of this collection as having two, two main components and two main parts. And so one of which are these interspecies collaborations that are happening computationally. So these, and this is done through these generative growth algorithms. And so the amazing thing about our natural world is that everything grows everything grows based on parameters. Our trees grow based on the light, based on the oxygen, all these different parameters. And so once you know these parameters, it's really quite simple to replicate them in parametric design softwares and parametric spaces. And so that's how I was able to create these really honest growth algorithms that show how these different collaborators would grow in different places where they could never grow in real life. And then the other aspect of the collection are these physical interspecies collaborations. And these are collaborations by happening that are happening by physically working with these living materials, with biomaterials and seeing what happens and co-creating with them. And so the first facet of the collection is called sea sprouts. And sea sprout is a computational collaboration with barnacles. And so barnacles can be modeled using the, using, um, the Voronoi function in parametric design softwares. And so what this algorithm allows us to do is see how barnacles would grow in places they could never grow in real life. And in this case, it's seeing how barnacles would grow on the human body. And so here you can see some of the computational process behind it and these generative algorithms. And once these algorithms, once we ended up with an algorithm that looked good on the body, it was then 3D printed in physical space. And then in the, in the case of the sea sprouts, it was actually paired with a physical collaborator. And so, um, and so here you can see two different versions of sea sprouts that were printed out, two out of the three, a top and a bottom. And these sea sprouts were then paired with physical collaborators to see what these impossible collaborations would look like between, in some cases, plants of the land and plants of the sea in this case. And so this is a collaboration between barnacles and mushrooms and how they would grow on the body. So these mushrooms were actually grown out of the barnacle holes. The mycelium was grown until it sprouted. This is a collaboration with barnacles and sea sprouts, or excuse me, alfalfa sprouts, which are the sprouts that we all eat in our salad. And these were again, hydroponically grown out of these barnacles. And then this is a collaboration with barnacles and pansies. And so one of the thoughts behind this aspect of the collection is how can we create so, so one of the thoughts behind this collection was looking at fast fashion. And right now we have fast fashion where we buy an outfit and it's only in style for a season. And as soon as it's out of style, we throw it out and we move on. And so one of the ways that Sea Sprouts is trying to interrupt that cycle is through creating incredibly slow fashion. So instead of this being fast fashion, it's incredibly slow because this shirt is changing every single day and it takes care and it takes time to grow. And so one of the perks of that is this shirt will never look the same way two days in a row because it's constantly growing. And so it will never be out of style because it's always changing and always evolving. And so here you can see what the, the sea sprout shirt looks like on the body. And so the next computational collaborator, the next facet of this collection was working with meandering coral. And so meandering coral is also referred to as brain coral in nature. And the way that it grows is actually through a curve differential growth logic algorithm. And so curve differential growth is this idea that things grow at different rates at different times, causing them to naturally curl in on itself and bubble and wiggle around. And so, once we know that it's with this curve differential growth logic, we can then, I, I then wrote an algorithm which would, which would simulate this curve differential growth logic. And so here you can see how this first starting with this very straight curl ends up wiggling out into this, um, into this large face mask. And here were a few different curves that were generated and a few different masks that were generated. And so, this entire collection was created through parametric design. And what's amazing about that is as soon, once you have the algorithms that you're using to, to create designs, they can then be applied to anything. And so in this case, it was the, all of the work came up front to create the algorithm that would create the curve differential growth. But as soon as I had that algorithm, I could apply it to as many different curves as possible. And so generating each of these different masks only took about a minute a mask each. 
And so what that means also is that all of these algorithms can be applied to anything. I'm really interested in wearable technology. And so I applied them all to wearables, but they can be applied to furniture, to architecture, to anything, which is super exciting. And so here you can see the meandering coral in action. And so one of the really interesting parts about this piece, Meander, is that I, I wanted to reference the deep sea in this piece. And that's why I made the entire structure glow. And this was referencing bioluminescence in the deep sea. And oftentimes underwater, animals glow actually for camouflage. And that way, if a predator is looking up, they camouflage with the sun coming in from the, from the top of the sea. And that glow actually cancels them out. And so what was really fascinating about this piece is by adding this glow in real life, it actually made it so that this face mask makes you invisible to surveillance. So by having these bright lights all around the eyes, it camouflages your face. And it was really fascinating to see how this camouflage in the deep sea also applies to camouflage from our modern day technology and our modern day surveillance. And so that was a super interesting aspect of Meander. And so the other thing that's really interesting about Meander is that these curves will continue to grow algorithmically as long as I let them. And so each one of these pieces that was 3D print, printed really just represents a fossil of the piece because it, it is constantly growing and constantly changing in computational space. And so these are just really snapshots that are then printed out. And so the next facet of the collection is called Rooted, or it's called Root. It's either Root or Rooted. Um, and this uses a, is a computational collaboration between mushrooms. And so mushrooms grow with a differential growth logic, which is the same logic as the meandering coral, only with mushrooms, it's applied in 3D space. And so what this means is that the spheres of the mushrooms actually bulge out, and you can see this here. And so I created an algorithm that would that would create these differential growth in a on a, um, in computational space. And in this case, I applied it to the shoe. And so here you can see the mushroom or the shoe, the mushroom logic growing over time. And after this mushroom was generated, it was then um, after it was generated, it was then 3D printed in physical space and tested out as a real shoe. And there were a few really interesting things that um, came with that, but I'll, I'll tell you about that after I show you the video. And so this is the root shoe. And so this shoe was 3D printed with only 20% infill on a gigantic 3D printer. And there were a few really interesting things that came out of it. One was that the print only needed support to help itself um, print in the places where I created these natural interventions. And so in the places where the foot was, it needed a lot of support, but all the other curves actually were able to support themselves with printing. And this is a really exciting finding because some of these 
forms and these curves could never have been made in any other way, in a way that would support itself with printing. And so that was one really interesting finding. And the other fascinating finding was that these shoes, even though they were only printed out with 20% infill, which means they're mostly air inside, they can actually hold um, full body weight. And this was a happy surprise, which is due to the mushroom shape that naturally occurs. It's actually very sturdy shape with all the curves. And so it was really cool to see kind of how mushrooms are grown really sturdily in real life and how when you apply that into digital space, it also works with our modern day machines. And so these were shoes that were grown around the foot. And so the next facet of this collection is called crystal interfaces. And the idea with the Beyond Biomimicry collection is how can we create natural interventions at each step in the design and manufacturing process to make sure we have nature growing and working with us and working for us. And so what crystal interfaces does is it's actually conductive crystals that are grown. And so to make crystals, it's the same as when we were kids making rock candy. So you create a highly saturated solution with whatever kind of crystals you're making. In this case, I'm using um, Epsom salt crystals. So it's an incredibly salty mixture and I added a conductive material. And as the water evaporates from this mixture, you're left with these beautiful crystals. And so creating conductive crystals means that all of these crystals can then be used as electronic components because they're conductive. They can behave exactly like any other metal would. And so what this means is that we can now grow electronic interfaces that are all grown, not made. And one of probably my favorite aspect of this is that when you're done with the electronic interface or you want to, you no longer need the product or whatever, you can just add water and the crystal will dissolve and then you can regrow it to be whatever, whatever you want it to be. And so paired with these conductive crystals were an aggregated structure of the crystals. And this was again, computationally generated. And so on the microscopic level of these crystals is the aggregated structure, which it means it's the form of the actual molecules lined up. And so I was able to then generate this, this form, which really shows you a really zoomed in look of what these crystals look like. And so pairing this all together, this piece is a wearable that actually that as you approach this conductive crystal, the entire piece begins to vibrate and glow, mirroring what's happening on the crystal in the microscopic level. And so a lot of crystals, when you compress them, they actually create an electronic charge. This is known in quartz. This is known in a ton of different natural, natural, natural stones. And so this is really magnifying the crystal to a point of being a wearable um, and allowing a wearer to feel that experience. And so here is crystal interfaces. And so here you can see the structures of this crystal interface. And so the next and kind of the final full facet of this collection is collaboration with slime mold. And so slime mold, it can be found all over the world. It's that often white or yellow foamy stuff that you can see on trees. And I know here in the United States on the East Coast, we've had a ton of rain lately. And so it's actually almost on every single tree around here, but it can be found all over the world. And slime mold is actually known for being able to find the most efficient path. 
And so this has been used in science in a lot of different ways. Um, scientists have used, it, have used it to model dark matter. They've used it to model the universe. They've used it to model, designers have used it to model subway systems. And so it's a really fascinating handy trick where nature can do things a lot simpler than um, we can in a lot of ways. And so in order to collaborate with slime mold, I ended up using, I ended up working with this um, grasshopper plugin called Nuclei, and it actually allows you to map swarming and slime mold behavior. And so here you can see these points in 3D space represent um, food sources, and the pink represents the slime mold. And so right before our eyes, the slime mold just found the most efficient path between the food sources. And now, in this video, it looks like it happened really fast, but in reality, it actually, this video is actually compressed of about an hour long because it takes a lot of processing power to be able to do that. Um, but this, this collaboration, as soon as I saw how the slime mold wanted to grow between the food sources, I knew that it wanted to be a crown because it had naturally made this perfect place for a stone to be set. And so paired with this um, computational computational generation of slime mold was actually physical slime mold. And so the idea with this was that if we wear slime mold around us every day, we can actually help help our world as by carrying around and spreading decomposers. So as humans, we're creating so much waste and slime mold is actually known for being able to eat almost anything. Um, and so the idea was to leave a slime mold, little slime mold here and there to help clean up after yourself throughout the day. And so here you can see the molded collection in action. And so here is the molded collection and you can see the slime mold is the yellow stuff and in this picture it's quite dehydrated which actually made it kind of flatten out to this beautiful paper. But you can see in that slime mold are actually oats and that's what what I used to feed the slime mold. And so here the molded collection is on a body. And now the next facet of this collection is some ongoing research that I've been doing. And it is again, looking at how can we create natural interventions at each step in the design and manufacturing process. And so this is looking at um, the textile dyeing process. So the textile and dyeing, textile dyeing process is one of the most polluting processes in the world where it takes thousands and thousands of gallons of water to dye a single garment. And once the, once the water in the dye and the water is no longer consistent, the dye is just poured out oftentimes with no regards as to what happens to that water and where it goes. And this is incredibly harmful for our planet and our environment. And so these, bac these bacterial dyes and bacterial collaborators are some research that I've been doing to create new bacteria dyes that are all grown, not made. And so here you can see some of the process behind working directly with bacteria to create new dyes for textiles. And there are a few things that are really exciting about bacteria dyes. One is that the bacteria will grow exponentially. And so whereas in the normal di traditional dyeing process, you need a lot of synthetic dye. Like when you're out of dye, you need more. In this case, when you're out of dye, you just have to wait a few days and the dye will multiply and create a ton more. And so here was kind of the first, the first blip of that research, which was working with a magenta dye, which was super fascinating. And this dye was uh, super good in a lot of ways, but not as great in other ways. Um, one thing with this dye that was a bit tricky was as soon as you inoculated the bacteria, the color actually changed. And so we ended up switching to a different dye for this. But 
one of my one of my favorite parts about this bacteria dying process is not necessarily the color because we've been dying with natural dyes and our ancestors have been dying with natural dyes for thousands and thousands of years. But what's amazing to me about this is seeing the patterns that the bacteria grow and that they that they design and create it. And that to me is really exciting, a really exciting collaboration. And so here you can see um, this is a new bacteria we've been working with, which is called Biolysin, and it can be found again all over the world in puddles or any any water um, water source all over the world. It's actually antimicrobial, and so it's often found on um, like the skins of fish, actually in the ocean. Um, but one of the really exciting things about this dye is that it's can be found all over the world and it's ecological all over the world. And so it's really exciting to be able to grow bats and bats of these dye and then have it be able to be um, not necessarily bio biological waste because it's, it's completely natural. And so this is kind of some ongoing bacteria research that's been happening. And so this is kind of concludes the Beyond Biomimicry collection for right now. And ultimately the Beyond Biomimicry collection is all about interspecies collaboration. It's about unstable media, experimental interfaces, augmented materials and electronic textiles. And this collection could not have been made without our wonderful partners and support from Dassault Systems. And so Dassault is the company that traditionally makes SolidWorks, which we all know and love. And they have some really exciting new deals and new softwares for us to try out now. And my favorite part is that all of these new softwares are now only $99 a year. It used to cost like a gazillion dollars a year, and now it's super accessible for makers. And so here's some of the amazing things that we can now do with this new software package from Dassault Systems. And just to highlight a few of my favorites, I work on a Mac computer. And so because the, because the new software package is all cloud-based, it means it doesn't matter if you're on a Mac or PC computer, you can use it anywhere that you have internet, which is super amazing for me. Um, and super amazing for a ton of makers everywhere. And it also has some really, really exciting softwares and really, really exciting new things that you can do. It has a wonderful parametric design software, X Generative, that I've been using and absolutely loving. And so if you want to hear more about the maker deal or check it out, you can go to solidworks.com slash maker. And until then, I'm so happy to be speaking with you all. And I'd love to answer some questions or start some conversation about anything you guys might have have want or want to ask. So thank you so much. Okay, thanks, Kate. Um, so we don't have any questions uh, until now, like uh, nobody in the chat. But what I uh, like, I'll start with one question. What are you now working on? Like, wh what's what's happening in the future, in near future? Yeah, so there's there's a ton of exciting things that are happening. Um, so one of which is I'm still continuing the bacteria dye research, which has been super fun and super exciting to watch grow beneath my eyes. And the other thing is I'm continuing as the artist in residence at Dassault Systems. And there I'm focusing on how, to, how can we take some of these growth algorithms and some of this interspecies um, thinking and apply it to the home and apply it to things other than wearable technology. And so that's been super, super duper exciting. Um, and I guess one other tidbit of something that I've been working on is now not only, so, so this past project was looking at growth algorithms and how can we create growth algorithms and they were then 3D printed in plastic. And so that feels a little funny. And so one of the things that I'm working on now is how can we take these growth algorithms and, and visualize them in physical space in a real living material. And so I've been doing some research and growing root structures into some of these forms, growing mushrooms into these forms and really thinking about how we can kind of make this process full circle um, in, towards a, in, in terms of thinking of this interspecies world and design. Okay, perfect. So Catherine uh, is asking, um, uh, well, she's commenting. Uh, so cool, Kate, I work in a similar symbiotic design field. This is uh, this for me is really um, incredibly inspiring. And then she goes on to ask the question: How were you able to encapsulate the slime mold in the print orifices? Did you use plastic film for that? Yeah. So the slime mold. What was really fascinating about that project is actually 
what had happened was I got the slime mold before I was necessarily ready to use it. And it, and as a result of that, it actually dried out. And it, when, it, when it dried out, it created the most beautiful paper film naturally on its own. And so if I were to now like spray a little water on the crown, it would kind of start to develop, like it would grow in 3D space again, probably similar to how the mushroom shoe grew generatively. But when it dries out, it actually just becomes one organism and waits until it's watered again. Okay. Uh, Elizabeth Lloyd is asking, what was your most surprising result? Um, I think, well, there's a lot of surprising results throughout the entire project. I think for me, the most kind of breathtaking and wow moment was seeing the mushroom shoes grow beneath my eyes. Because up until then, it was kind of like, everything ended up pretty much how I expected it. You know, it wasn't necessarily rocket science. It was like, oh, this is what a barnacle looks like. This is how it grows, mimic that process. But I'd never actually really analyzed the growth of a mushroom and how it got to be where it was. And so for me to see kind of this mushroom go from this flat face and bubble into this three-dimensional form was really quite remarkable and quite, quite breathtaking. That's definitely my, that's definitely my favorite growth algorithm in terms of the output the input to the output ratio of what you what you put in versus what you get. It's really kind of an exciting gamble each time almost. Okay. Uh, so Kadar Ukide or Kedar Ukide is asking, uh, uh, again, he's commenting, this is uh, really new for us. Uh, it's quite interesting, great job, Kate. Um, then Catherine is asking, have you tried a biodegradable filament or grole for inoculation uh, of live species? Yeah, so I, I haven't tried a biodegradable filament yet other than PLA plastic, which actually is sugar-based and is a biomaterial in itself. Um, but I've been looking towards research of creating kind of, I've been, I've been thinking of a few different paths. So there's one which is kind of creating with these wood-based filaments in 3D printers. And so the benefit of that would be that then you, the wood is just, it's wood like anything else and you can then impregnate it with mushrooms or whatever you want and then create growth from there. Um, and I've also been thinking a lot about kind of the difference between 3D printing and additive manufacturing versus kind of CNCing and subtractive and thinking of some molds and some different ways to create biomaterials there. But I think right now what I'm, what I'm working on right now and, and most excited about is this idea of growing these root structures within these molds themselves. Um, and so really, so the, the thought behind that is that if you, if you look at the way plants roots grow, they naturally kind of start to knit themselves together. And so imagining if we could harness that knit to create new, new clothing that knits itself as in the fibers already grow together versus, um, versus having, you know, to, grow a plant, harvest, harvest the fibers, harvest the carton, cotton, spin it into a yarn, and then manually knit it together. And so that's kind of where my mind has been at um, most immediately. And that's some things I'm really excited to get started working on um, in the full scale right now. Okay. Uh, Ken Burke Yurt is asking, uh, thank you, Kate, astonishing process, inspiring. I wonder, uh, how do you envision the future from the point of view of interaction between human and the ecosystem? Yeah, so I think, I think as designers, what we're seeing is this new kind of, I don't want to say trend, but this new really push for biodesign and push for creating things that are not necessarily not necessarily creating products that have a, the idea of a product and it does a certain thing and then you throw it away, but really thinking about the entire life cycles of products, the entire life cycle of the manufacturing process. And so to be a designer today, it involves so much more than it did. It involves so much more than just making the product. It's really thinking about how is this product gonna decompose? That's equally as important to what happens when it's living. How is this product going to you know, go through all of these different steps and globalization along the way. And is that going to create a positive or negative impact? And so it's really looking at, you know, as designers, it's really thinking a lot more about systems thinking, and that's becoming more and more a trend. And how do we, how do we think of this product within the context of our larger world? And so for me, what the clear answer to that is, 
instead of creating products that are, you know, bad for our environment, why don't we just grow products that are natural to our environment and feel natural to our bodies? And so that's kind of what a lot of the thinking behind this collection is now is how can we grow these products and grow this world that's naturally ecological because it comes from this planet. And that is, it's really interesting to kind of see where, where that leads, because on one hand, we have a ton of biomaterials that are commonly known to designers today, like making kombucha leather or making synthetic plastics out of agar. And these are oftentimes pretty, um, they're pretty gross and they're not necessarily equal quality to what we're used to today in terms of plastics and this and that. And so it's really kind of this test of how do you, how do you as a designer go past this step of like, cool, I made some kombucha leather, cool, I made some things, but it can't necessarily scale up and reach the scale to how can we not only create products that are grown and not made, and how can we not only create products that are ecological to our planet, but then have that, have that spread out across the consumer scale and have that spread out to each and every product in each and every person's hand or living room. And so that's ultimately, to me, the code to crack. And there's some really exciting products that are doing that today and some really exciting things that are happening with that today. But oftentimes I see with kind of bio design and bio-based products is that they don't, they don't necessarily make it, make it past the living room of whoever designed it or whoever created it. Okay. Catherine has a comment. Yes. Hemp based filaments or grow lay are great for mushrooms. Amazing. Awesome. Okay, uh, I think one of the last questions is by Fred. Uh, he's saying, I thought grasshopper was specific to Rhino. How does grasshopper work in SolidWorks and does it work in the non-web standalone versions also? Yeah, so grasshopper is specific to Rhino and until this kind of new package came along from Dassault Systems, grasshopper was really one of the only ways that you could create parametric design and parametric systems. And so Dassault has this new software package and one of the programs in it is called X Generative and it's their, X, it's their generative design um, software. And it's super, it's really exciting to see this generative design software because as Grasshopper, it was very limited to Rhino and you could kind of work in Rhino or Grasshopper and not necessarily both at the same time. In X Generative, you can kind of go back and forth and you can work, you can work in the kind of work in the param parametric modeling view. And then you can switch back to kind of the natural native SOLIDWORKS view and everything updates accordingly. And so it's really, really exciting. And again, I wanna give a shout out because the other amazing thing about it is if you're in the Rhino and Grasshopper world, you know that most, most things only work on a PC computer and with X Generative because it's all cloud-based and with the new software package, you can work on it in, with any computer, which is pretty amazing. You don't need to have necessarily a super like amped up or fancy computer to create results. Um, and so that alone is really um, creates an incredible ac accessibility to all these all of these other designers and makers. Perfect. And uh, Fred, um, you know, you can contact me uh, or Kate later. Um, in the in the comment, I've given my email ID also. So this is great. Uh, so Sapna Pawar from India, I think, is asking, can I get some more information about bacterial collaborators, uh, please? It's interesting. I'm from microbiology background. It's unbelievable for us. It's great. Yeah. So the bacteria. Um... I'm working with a, a natural bacteria. It's called Violicin. It's spelled like a viola, V-I-O-L-A-C-E-I-N. And it is a natural purple bacteria that can be found all over the world. It's an, it has antimicrobial properties and we've been having success with it dyeing textiles. Um, and so one of the cool things about this bacteria is it's incredibly stable in the sense that, um, excuse me, in the sense that it does not the color does not change based on heat or based on water or whatnot, which is really kind of rare in these a lot of these bacteria. Um, and it's also not poisonous, which is also another lovely thing because oftentimes these beautiful colors that are found in nature, there's a ton of beautiful reds and they're all pathogenic um, and not good for humans. And so 
I encourage you to check out Violison in the Violison that might be around you and you can reach back out to me if you have any more questions about it. Okay. Uh, so Fred is asking, has anyone tried uh, drawing with antibiotics to control bacterial growth patterns and design? Yeah, so we, we have tried drawing with antibiotics and we have not seen that work with our particular bacteria that we're using. Um, and so that was, that was kind of a surprise, but also annoying. But what we have seen work is that the bacteria that we're using, the violicin, does not like to grow um, if there's no food for it. And so in order to create patterns, we've actually been leaving parts of it floating in the air and stuff um, instead of on the plate or in the liquid broth that's feeding it. And so it's really easy to create kind of tie-dye patterns or to create intricate patterns based on how you, how you put the bacteria or how you put the textile on the bacteria. Um, but that's kind of, that's our code to crack right now is how can we create these, how can we create more intricate patterns with it? Um, and kind of try to try to control a little more of the growth. And that's what we've been working on. Okay, so uh, Kadar is uh, thank you, uh, thanking you for the information. Uh, Catherine is asking, have you tried using slime mold on textiles to create patterns? Yeah, so I, I personally have not tried it yet, but I do know how, how or I have heard how you would do that. Um, and so the way to do that, which you might already know, is that with slime mold, if you feed it multicolored oats, so if you take the oats, you're feeding it and soak it in, um, you know, a natural dye or food coloring, the slime mold will actually turn that color. And so then if you grow the slime mold on top of a textile, and then when you wipe the slime mold away, it will actually leave a print of that growth structure and that growth pattern that it does. I have not tried it personally, but I have heard that it works. And that is definitely on my list to try personally. But the thing about slime mold is it kind of, um, it, it really can take over your entire space if you're not careful about keeping it, keeping it in where you want it. And so it's a bit, it's a bit, um, when, when you're in it, you're in it, but when you're not in it, it's not necessarily super fun to jump back into kind of the slime mold living situation. <laughs> Okay, so Catherine is saying that is so unreal. Next experiment. Okay, uh, I've got some uh, some baby sleeping. Okay, uh, time to wake them up. So, okay, so Kate is saying, uh, Catherine is saying uh, thanks to you. Okay, Kate. Awesome. Um, so Kate, I have one question for you um, from my side. And in the meantime, I'll see if I missed um, you know, anybody's question. Uh, to, 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 okay, um, so. Can you actually introduce yourself? Like, what have you done in, in the past? And uh, are you a student? Uh, and give a bit of a background if somebody, uh, because some of the people uh, joined late uh, in, in the session. Yeah, of course. So, my name is Kate, and many of you know that already. Um, but I'm a designer and I build wearable technology and I am from the Boston area. I got my start actually by dropping out of high school and I went to this startup school called New View Studio that was kind of born from MIT. I was the first graduate of that program actually, like it was a very, very new program. And the program was all project based and based on the architectural studio model. So the idea was instead of having nine to five class, we have problems to solve every day. And so for two weeks, you're focused on one problem and you solve that problem, you document your process, you create a working prototype, and then you give a presentation about your process. And so I was kind of ingrained in that model ever since I was a kid and became the first graduate of New View, which was super exciting and cool experience. And then I ended up continuing my education in the Brown residual degree program. And there I studied, I received one in undergrad from Brown University in social innovation and entrepreneurship, and then another undergrad from the Rhode Island School of Design in industrial design and computational technology. And kind of my thinking there was really how can we use design to eradicate social problems. And what I kept finding is over and over again, the social problem that I kept coming back to was humans merger with technology and humans relationship with technology. And so I kind of became enamored with this idea of how can we create new wearable computers and wearable devices and this make this merger between humans and technology easier and feel natural and feel good. And so from there, I spent, you know, 
a ton of time focusing on biomimicry and copying nature to create the next generation of wearable computers. And then one day I woke up and I was like, I'm sick of copying nature. Like, why am I trying to interpret what's happening around me? Why don't I just let what's happening around me and work with nature as a co-collaborator? And so that's when kind of this beyond biomimicry framework started. And what I realized was all of this framework could then be copied and generated in computational space. So as much as we want wearable technology now to transport us into virtual spaces, we can also virtually grow these same natural processes. And so it's really, I'm really fascinated now also kind of looking at this whole idea of the metaverse and this idea that humans are existing more and more in virtual spaces and really think the thesis applies the same, which is we need to grow nature in virtual spaces as well as physical spaces. And we can't forget our roots and forget where we came from. And I really believe personally that you know, the uncanny value of the uncanny valley effect, which is when, you know, something looks too much like a human and it's, but not enough. So it's a little creepy. And I really believe that that kind of uncanny value effect also applies to nature and applies to our natural world. And so what we need to do is create these honest growth algorithms and simulations that really model how, model how nature grows exactly how it does. And so this idea of not only preserving our natural world so we don't forget it, but also using nature as a designer to grow our natural world and grow our technologies around us so they feel natural. And so that's kind of where I'm at now. And I'm really excited to be kind of continuing some of this work at Dassault Systems as one of their artists in residencies. Um, and I'm really just focused on how can we grow our future around us and how can we preserve and emulate our natural, these natural practices that are happening everywhere all over the world in virtual and in real spaces. And so that is, that is the me in a nutshell. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, thank you, Kate. I have to ask this last question because I know Kader uh, asked this question and then we'll close off the session. Uh, he's asking, uh, can we use different color pigment, uh, pigments producing bacteria or pigment producing bacteria for different color appearances in bacterial collaborators? Yeah, so it's so. So what I found with working with bacteria is that some bacteria are super stable and super good for collaborating with and others are not at all. Um, so for example, that first pink bacteria that I showed you all, it created a beautiful pink, but as soon as you inoculated the bacteria and killed the bacteria, so you could actually take it out of the lab safely, it actually created like a gross kind of tan brown color. And so it's really hard to find a good bacteria that is not only kind of stable in terms of the color can survive heat and can survive actually um, the bacteria dying itself, but also in terms of that it's not harmful to our bodies because a lot of these beautiful colors that are found in nature, there's tons of reds and oranges, which are natural bacterias, and almost all of them are pathogenic and really bad for humans and really bad to work with. And so it's really just a question of researching your bacteria, understanding what you're working with and where you're working with. You know, one of the cool things about BioLysin is it's found all over the world and it's completely natural. And so even if you're not working necessarily in a bacterial lab, it, you can actually do some of this research in your home. Um, there's a whole kind of citizen science side of it, which has been um, you know, setting up these DIY bacteria labs in your home with pressure cookers as an autoclave and all this other crazy stuff. Um, but so it's really just knowing kind of what you want to get out of it, what your safety things, what your safety um, kind of situation is around you and where you're working and then seeing, you know, how you, how the bacteria likes to do what you want it to do. Um, but there's definitely there's definitely some places or if you just google other natural bacteria you can definitely find some other ones but it's really just kind of knowing with when working with bacteria safety is just the number one thing that you really have to keep in mind and keep in check okay perfect and uh, okay one last question because it's it's from kate to kate uh, so Catherine is asking what do you think is the future of bioelectronics or biovariables do you see them in the future being implemented outside the bio art space? Yeah, so it's a really, that's a great question. And I guess, I, I guess I can answer that in a few different ways. So one of the things, 
So I'll answer that with kind of a story about wearable technology and how it's gotten to where it was today. So I made kind of my first wearable computer 10 years ago. And 10 years ago, it was really cool. It was really exciting. It was really, really weird. And what happened was I made this wearable device that could, it was a musical prosthetic, so it could pick up your body movements and turn it into sound. And it was super exciting and everyone went crazy about it and ended up walking on New York Fashion Week and Boston Fashion Week. And it was a really cool project. And then after that, I kept making these wearable computers and it was just kind of, they were really cool, but they were really weird and no one knew what to do with it. And that was because this was 10 years ago. This was kind of before Fitbits were the norm, before Apple Watches even existed. And so no one really knew what to do with wearable technology. And then you fast forward to where we are today and every single company is making wearable computers. Everyone's making wearable technology. Now it's like, how can we make the coolest, best wearable piece of technology? And so it's really interesting to see kind of like for, you know, for the past seven or eight years, I was just making weird wearables and it wasn't like it caught on. It wasn't like it was really interesting. It wasn't like there was anything anywhere for it to go after that. And I think what we're seeing now is the same thing is happening with, um, with bio design and, and these bio projects is that right now it's really cool. And there are these kind of one-offs that are really interesting at a personal scale, but the world hasn't necessarily caught up to it in terms of how do we manufacture these things at a mass scale? How do we, um, you know, what are, what are like some of the um, public policy things that have to be involved in creating these bio designs and these things that are shipping all over the world. And so what I predict is in a few years, I think everything's going to be bio designed. I think you won't buy plastic bags at the grocery store. You'll buy biodegradable bags. You won't get styrofoam. You'll only get mycelium instead. And so ultimately what I think is that all of our electronics and everything that's happening and all of the, the pieces that have to come together in order to make that future, everyone in their respective and separate, um, in their separate professions is working towards this. You know, we're working on how can we create new electronic devices that are only made of fibers. So only completely soft textile devices. We're working on how can we grow more conductive crystals? How can we create batteries that are small enough? And so right now, everyone's kind of working to do their part and there it's really soon that they're all gonna converge and create you know, these new biodegradable electronic devices, biodegradable sensors, sensors that only touch your skin and aren't necessarily this thick or whatever. And so it's a really, really exciting time to be working wearable technology because you know, wearable technology just caught on, but the biology side of it is just becoming exciting and just becoming cool. And so if there is any kind of advice that I would give to any other, any future designers or any designers out there, it's don't, don't give up on the bi biology side of it right now, just because the infrastructure isn't there yet, because that's only going to catch up and that's only going to amplify. And so really create, create for the future that's for the future infrastructure that will be there in five years, as opposed to the infrastructure right now, because as designers, we have to be constantly thinking ahead and be thinking about our planet, especially right now. You know, we're in this situation because other designers and other people out there didn't necessarily think ahead in five years. Okay, perfect. So I think we'll end with uh, one observation um, that Fred is, is making, and uh, probably maybe you can comment on that. Fred is saying, I wonder if the future is back at the Center for Bits and Atoms, making GMO bacteria that produces chemicals that act on materials and staining or dyeing them. So it's a second order process. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think ultimately what we're coming to see is that, you know, as humans, we exist and we live in ecosystems. And it's really weird how our devices and our products and everything that we have around us right now doesn't seem to match that ecosystem. You know, nothing depends on one or another. And so ultimately, if we not only want nature to survive, but we want things that feel natural to our bodies and to kind of keep this planet alive in life, we need to create things in terms of ecosystems. And so that means in terms of, you know, bio design and electronics design are no longer separate. Our human bodies kind of senses and everything about that should be involved in every single purchase, every single product that we surround ourselves in. And so really thinking about how can we create these larger living ecosystems and surround ourselves with these 
personal ecosystems that all then interact in kind of the larger the larger network. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Kate. So if somebody wants to get in touch, uh, where can they uh, can they write to you or where yeah. can they follow the follow your work? Yeah, totally. So you guys can find me at beyondbiomimicry.com. Um, it's also the same as biomimetic.com. I can put that in the chat. Um, or biomimetic.io actually. Um, oops, hold on. I can read that. Perfect. Biomimetic.io, um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then you can email me at kate 4 mayor with the number four, mayor at gmail.com. And it has been so nice speaking with you all today. <laughs> okay, perfect. Uh, there you are. That's your Gmail address. Okay, thank you so much, uh, everybody. Thank you, Kate. Uh, everybody have a nice day. Awesome. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone.